you can start then and I will follow up. Hi, I'm Melora Norman. I'm the media special specialist here at Vassalboro Community School and would like to welcome you to the Vassalboro Reads 2021 speaker series. We're so glad you could come. Just a couple of quick housekeeping tips before we get started. During the presentation for the best um, experience for everyone, we ask that you keep your volume muted to minimize background noise. Afterward, we'll have some time for questions and answers, and at that time it will work best if everyone mutes their volume, except for the person speaking. Finally, we want to note that we will be recording this program and posting it publicly online. So um, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. Can't wait to hear our tonight's speaker. And uh, so without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce my fel fellow program coordinator, Brian Stanley, uh, Vassal Pearl Public Library Director, who will introduce today's wonderful speaker. Take it away, Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Stanley, the director at Vassal Pearl Library. Um, yeah, like Melora said, thank you for joining us today. Um, our entire community read is made possible by a Libraries Transforming Communities grant through the American Library Association. Um, we're seeking to stimulate discussion and awareness around alewives here in Vassalboro and come away as a more informed community. Um, please join us for future online events. You can always check the vassalbororeads.me website for future updates. Um, Today, we're very fortunate to have Rebecca Ray with us. She's the illustrator of Swimming Home. Um, she's gonna to speak to us today about how words can expire illustrations to tell more of a story. And she's gonna share some of her artwork with us, which will be great. Um, so without further delay, I'll introduce Rebecca Ray and thank you for joining us. Thank you guys, thank you so much for having me and inviting me and thank you also to the sweet family that um, has come into, I, I can't see you, but um, I'm thinking of you and I'm glad you're here and I welcome anybody else, welcome to my studio in fact. Um, I'm here in East Blue Hill, Maine and as you will hear, I have sort of an accent. You can call me um, Rebecca Ray. And I am originally from Tennessee, but I've been in Maine since my late teens. And I love Maine because mostly of all the wildlife and the nature and the coastal places that I have lived near. And I wanna tell you that my father, Ray Bradley, was a great artist. And when I was a little girl, I'd sit beside him and I would admire the lines that would, would come onto the paper. And I said, oh, I wanted to be an artist too. And then my mother worked in the laboratory and she was always asking me to come to see what was underneath the microscope and at a hospital. And so I had science and art in my house all growing up. So I, I was always doing out, they used to call me the turtle girl because I could find the habitat, the places where the turtles live. And it was just one of those things. I, I spent more time outside and I love to draw. And one of the things that I still do today is not only my drawing and my painting, but I also do sculpting. As you can see, I have some friends here because just this morning I saw a red fox run in our backyard and he's made out of plaster, hydrostone plaster. I carve him and I paint him. And I have always loved to work in this kind of clay that's so soft, it never hardens. And when I get an idea, this is a, a friend of mine's little dog and, who always plays with this little ball and I'm doing a bigger sculpture in bronze of this little dog. But I often use this soft clay because you once you're done, you just squish it back and it never hardens. And the other things I do, Here's a quite large piece. I had to do a sculpture of a raven. And I had never really done a sculpture of a raven. So I did that 
soft. It's like a sculpy clay. And I formed the shape and that helped me move its head because it was movable. I could just put it in position. And that helped me do my paintings and drawings of it. And then eventually it's going to be put in bronze. I have loved working in nature. As I said, I love to go and sit by the, the Patton Stream Falls. I was always wanting to see the alewives because when, as you know, when the alewives come, there's the bald eagle, the ospreys, the cormorants, the seals. So I knew I'd be guaranteed to see wildlife. And so I would come home and I would do sculptures and I loved them so much. I even hammered out a copper version, my interpretation of an LY. Did several of those. I use my sculptures and drawings and murals too. So this is a mural I did for a school in Deer Isle, but I, I had to do this relief carving of them. And I always start in clay and then I draw them out and I carve them and paint them. Animals have been in my life, my favorite things. I just said children and animals are the most fulfilling. I love them both so much. So as an artist to come up to my studio and I'll show you around um, and think about animals and children all day, it's the best job. And here I am working in the backyard when we had lots of birds, but I would come right up to draw the rabbit, which we had several rabbits. And there's my favorite rooster, as you can see right there. I'll show you one more picture. One of my favorite animals of all that we had here was Goosey Goose. Goosey Goose Goose, Goosey Goose Goose, the last name. And there's the baby. And on this very day that Goosey Goose was born, Mama Goose and Goosey Goose, my grandson was born. So we had to have goose parties for a little while. And every time I'd go out in the yard, this goose would follow me. And here I am sitting with them. And whatever I was doing, they will be right beside me. So you'll see my version of Goosey Goose in clay. And you'll see I'm in the process. Some of the things I'm showing you right now, there's some carvings of L, my interpretation very loosely from a piece of driftwood. I, don't, I hope you can see that of uh, the alewives. There's Salty the seal. He is a seal pup that I met on the beach. I had to make a carving and clay version of him. And this is how I start my clay pieces with just like you would do paper mache. It's just the wound up paper with tape, lots and lots of tape. And um, my space, has everything that gets quite messy, which is so nice because you don't have to worry about it. And I'm gonna show you, there's my fish up there, the alewife, small fish, big impact. And my father, I have my wall related to him and his whirly gigs that he would make and he and I, but I just wanna show you. I have been so fortunate to have received a phone call one day asking if I would like to illustrate a children's book. And it was Tilbury House Publishers. And they said they knew my work. I'd been painting for a very long time. Uh, the other paintings that I make, I make prints, 
I make cards and I sell those cards in the galleries and shops. I go to places where I can see these creatures live so I understand. And if I can't see them live, I do lots of research. Here is one of my um, paintings of the bullfrog in another book written by Kimberly Ridley called The Secret Pool. And if you see a bullfrog in a vernal pool, you know that he's going to want to gobble everything up in that vernal pool. I'll tell you about that book. This book, Thanks to the Animals, was the first book that I had illustrated, written by Alan Sockabasin. And it's a pest. He's a wonderful, amazing Passamaguady storyteller about a little boy who falls off his bobsled during the winter when they were doing their migration from the shore to the woods for their survival. But Alan's words inspired me. I had to learn and research so much about the culture of the Passamaquoddy people. And also, here's Kimberly's book, Kimberly Ridley, The Secret Pool. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, her work, but um, if, especially right now that you hear the peepers and seeing the wood frogs and the yellow spotted salamanders. It's wonderful. She is a wonderful writer that inspired me. And then I got the call for interest in alewives by Swimming Home by Susan Hanshatterly. This was an exciting moment for me because as I was showing you, I was always looking for the alewives and I would go down to Patton Stream near me to look for them and help them with other people, moving rocks, with buckets, trying and nets, trying to help them into some places that were really difficult for them. And Susan writes all about it. And I, I first, when I heard about it, I, I said, Susan, I, she's also a friend of mine, so that made it even better, but she sent me the manuscript, and those words that she sent me the, in the manuscript were so inspiring and exciting. The words that she used just in the first page that I fell in love with when she says, Pesca raced through the ocean with the other alewives in her school as winter winds whipped the water into steep waves and the sleet fell. When she used the winds whipped and raced instead of using words like just they swim, she used words like raced the winds whipped, their flashing silvery scales, drifting down, rising up, splashing down, sudden bright bold flashes. All of those type of action words that she used to help describe the scene. I would read her story over and over with a tape recorder. That's how I would get started. So I'd start to close my eyes as I listened and imagined her, her alewives and Pesca. She named the alewife Pesca. So by giving that fish a name, I immediately became involved with Pesca. Anyways, what I wanted to tell you, when I first started illustrating, I had, as I said, I'd been painting a while and sculpting, but there were things I had to learn about in the illustration process. And I'm gonna use Susan Hand Shetterly's book as an example. I love this particular painting that I'm gonna show you and tell you about. Um, 
this, I'm going to uh, not read everything because I, I know Susan's planning on reading to you, but I wanted you to see this is a full spread. This is what you call both sides. Uh, when you see the, the, when you open your book, you'll see a full spread. You want to feel like you can jump into that picture. So the one thing I had to do, learning about the full spread, here's the original painting, as you can see. Can you all see that? Yes, we can see that, yeah. So the first thing I had to do was not only do my rate research about learning what alewives looked like and understanding that little charcoal dot behind their heels, I had to learn about what the middle of the page is called. It's, it's called the gutter. It's a funny word. It's like when you're riding your bike and uh, you just don't want to fall in the middle or on the side of the road. So you don't want to go in the gutter. That's how I tell the kids to help remember. So I had to learn to stay out of the gutter. And you do that in real life, stay out of the gutter. And the second thing I had to learn was a place for the words. So I had to give an area sort of open. So the gutter and a place for the words was the most important things I had to keep in mind when I was illustrating. I would do, oh, I also want you to see the expression on this beaver's face. Even in the, in the story, I imagined all these owl wives coming around the beaver's lodge and how they are doing their business. And here they are splashing all around. I was thinking, just sort of a grumpy face. And I imagined that. And what's so great about illustrating is everyone has their own interpretation and how they feel reading the story. So to me, when I read this particular page, um, they swam slowly in the beaver pond beside the round dome of the lodge. Two beavers sat on the lodge, gnawing the bark of green saplings and watching the fish as rain began to fall. Raindrops puckered the surface of the water. Night fell, the rain slowed, then stopped. A barred owl called, woof, 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 woof. Who cooks for you all? And it just, the way she wrote inspired that mood. And um, though the, the funny expression on that beaver makes me smile and laugh. And the other page that I love Again, I had to think about the gutter and a place for the words. But the way she described this page was so exciting and fearful. I felt fearful for Pesca, where she thought she was just resting in between two sticks in the water. And all of a sudden, which everybody's somebody's lunch, you know, all of a sudden the heron's beak came down. But I wanted to so show you that anytime you add an angle in a painting, you add more action versus if I had just made that fish just straight across, it wouldn't have the feeling like it does when you put an angle in the, in the work you're working on. It's little things like that that make a difference when you're working. So what I would do would do several on tracing paper. I would draw, I think maybe for this painting itself, maybe 10 different drawings and 
I would just find the one that seemed to the best to express the words. And then I went to use ink, watercolor, and pastel pencil. I wanted to be consistent in each painting. So that's the medium I used. You know, illustrators and artists, there's the sky's the limit. You could use just charcoal and watercolor. You could use collage. You can do digital illustration. But this is what works for me in the style that I have. What I usually love to share to everybody is remember you all have your own style. The way you speak is unique to you. The way you write your name is unique to you, the, different from your moms or your dads or your brothers or sisters. Just remember, it's, it's totally wonderful if you want to make your drawings and paintings so black and dark and fill the page. Or maybe you like to do delicate little marks on the page with just a little bit of color. It's both right. So just remember, we all have our own style. And, that's um, my interpretation and my style. And I, I just wanted you to see what those little sketches like this. I was just practicing with some children and I was talking about Pesca. So I do this, I'm gonna give you a demonstration of this particular technique that you can do at home is called Pesca Race Through the Stormy Seas with the other Elwads. Um, we all created our own drawings, but we, I wanted them to experiment with a full sheet, thinking of the gutter and a place for the words. We named it The Elwife Goes Home, another interpretation. But I wanna show you um, something that you can do at home very easily. Um, this is called, um, these are wonderful graphite sticks and they make a beautiful dark line. Just, um, it's so rich. It can, you can take a tissue, a paper towel, like I'll show you and smudge it and get tones. And I love, it feels like metal. And uh, you can get them at a place called Dick Flick um, online or some art stores carry them, um, but they're graphite sticks. This one is water soluble. So you can use actually a paintbrush and some water and you'll get a sort of like a watercolor using this. And uh, you could also use your regular school pencil and um, for what we're going to do today. And if you don't immediately have the graphite. And then I make up homemade, I call them smudgers, uh, but they're just made with a piece of paper towel. And I just take the paper towel and I fold it once. I fold it twice and I just take it and roll it as tight as you can, just as tight as you can. Until you get sort of like a little roll. And I put the tape, it could be masking tape, scotch tape, any kind of tape, duct tape you have around and just take that tape and put it in the middle. I use it in the middle so I can use both the left and the right sides. It's that easy. And you can use it with a napkin, a piece of tissue, just make sure you make it very, very tight. And the, the next thing, you can use a school pencil eraser if you don't have one of these, but these are fun to get. It's uh, at Dick Blick. Our other art stores would carry it. It's a kneaded eraser. It doesn't erase like your school pencils. It 
leave some marks on the page. But the main thing about the kneaded eraser is you have to pull it and put it together, pull it, put it together, pull it. It's rubber, comes apart, but that's how you keep it clean. And what I love about the kneaded eraser also is to make a small shape to get into areas, you can just pinch and point. And I do all my preliminary drawings with these three things. I do a whole, a whole booklet of sketches, for, especially for swimming home. I did so many sketches. I had quite a few that I could have showed you, um, shown you, but it was, oh my goodness. Um, I'll have to do that another time, but I wanted to show you an example. And if you have any questions, please, um, after I finish the demo, I'm going to give you some time if we have time for questions. Now, I don't know if you can see, are, are you getting a good image of it? Does it fill the screen? Uh, not quite filling, but we got a, we got a pretty good image of what you're, you're doing. You could be a little closer if you can. Okay. I would do that. Is I start with a contour drawing that I want to share with you guys. And it's just when I'm doing any kind of drawing and remember everyone's got their own style. And I lightly drew this just as a guide and, and I'll show you. A contour involves the outside edge. Everything in the world has that outside contour. So I start with a contour drawing. In, in Susan's description, what I learned about alewives is they're very wide from top to bottom and they're very, very scaly. And what I loved also about the alewives is sometimes the letter S curved. They have very small mouths because they only as they're swimming, I learned the small animals that they would go to the surface, the zooplankton, they would eat. Here's, as you can see, I sometimes, when I'm drawing, I think of the alphabet. And so the letter A or the, the letter C or the letter O. So I'm gonna show you with the letter O, another letter O, and one more letter O. And I want to show you an upside down. So letter A, a triangle. And there's one thing I know don't want to forget is this little dark smudge behind the gills. And as I said, alewives have so many scales that they're called saw bellies for a reason, as you'll see. And the thing that is most important to me in drawing is thinking of that light in the eyes, sort of like in the, the moon and the night sky, I always say. You want to have that sparkle of light, that sparkle of life in the eye. And to help with the scales, 
to make the body seem, oh, a little rounded. I just gave myself some guidelines right here. Sorry. Just to feel like the shape, the letter C. So any details, I might start the scales. Letter C. Letter C. In your own interpretation. Letter C. Go saw bellies. And and you don't have to do the whole thing with details, just a few places sometimes is all you need. Some gestures of movement. And there's that another letter C. Maybe I'm going to make it smaller here with my letter C. So I may want to add more details as I go. As you can see, this makes a very nice dark line. <laughs> I love to see the way drawings all of a sudden come to life for you as you work. Now, I love these graphite again because not only Sometimes I'll take the paper completely off and I'll use the point, even the bottom and the side of the graphite. And so what I do is I come, I want to have three things to help me. This could be pastel, this could be watercolor, but what I'm doing now is I'm trying to make a contrast light against dark. So I go right up to that contour line because I, I want this to pop. And by giving it the contrast, I'm trying to get it to really pop out. I hope you guys are seeing this. If you can do this, I say with your your school pencil, pastel pencils. It's not very easy to do with uh, colored pencils as you, um, you can't smudge with the colored pencil, but you could easily do this technique with the colored pencil without smudging. So you should try it. So I go right up to the line. You may go right under here too. I want to have the movement. It's coming. Of course, you can do your own size. I want it to be pretty large for you guys. So I made it a little bit bigger. So it takes more time, of course. I like that. I like to work big. And I really feel like the object or the subject comes more to life for me. So I have a hard problem. Sometimes I carry the drawing right off the page. I have to control myself. <laughs> and I can add more scales. Any details that you'd like, maybe a little smoke. And now, whoa, swimming right away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, I'm going to take this smudger that I told you about, and I simply use a technique where I take the 
my fingers and I squeeze it like you're playing a flute. I always say one, two, three, four. And I just want to smudge it. I want to get all of it blended. And you have to, I tell my students, you really just want to use your artist muscles and press as hard as you can in little circles. And I, I, I don't go across the page like this. I really take my time and you just can carry that tone. And I go over all my lines, even around the eyes. The tones, I, what I'm trying to do is make it look more real, more contrast. And I'll show you why. To make it more real, I need three things, dark, medium, and light. It's really fun to draw like this because if I use the colored pastel, I could do the same thing. Uh, you taking the contour with the, the pastel to make the outside edge and then filling in with the color and then smudging. So I love to get as much, see how you can take that graphite and just pull it all over the place. I love that about working with graphite. And so I could get quick shadows and tones really fast to get an idea of what I'm going to do with the finished painting. Next. And the, the last thing I love to do is with my kneaded eraser that I was telling you about, you stretch it, you put it together, stretch it, put it together to make sure that it's clean. Because if it's not clean, it won't pick up what I'm going to show you, the graphite where you need to be picked up. Because right now we have a dark area, a medium dark area, and we need some light. So I'm going to take this. And make that sparkle of light I told you about. And I want, there I go again, swinging away. There. That sparkle of light. So important. Say I want that gill to come out. So I'm just dragging. The scales to come out. The more dark you have down and smudge, the more you'll get these little details. Come. Just wherever you want to have that touch of light. Let's say, come through here. The back of it. You get a nice big piece of tape, I think, to make. So, usually, I'm drawing on a um, drawing board or on my table or kitchen table, wherever I can. Or out when I'm outside, just a board and a, a little rock to sit on. And you can see I'm pulling up just here and there. Wherever you want that light to be. You don't want to erase just everything you've just done. is all the area that seems really dark can be worked. It won't, it totally will not um, go away with the, the uh, needed eraser, but just keep remembering you have to stretch this. I usually keep it in 
one hand and keep it warm as it's easier to stretch. That works a lot better. And as I said, you can use your uh, school pencil and get the same idea, dark, medium, and light. And if you, I sometimes love to even go back in and to make more contrast. Just pushing, I, I call it, if you're pushing, I'm going to really enhance those scales. You can go back in. Make certain ones darker. Make a little shadow under the eye. You can keep working back and forth. Same technique. Once you do a little more drawing, using the smudger, I called it. And enhancing that eye, make it even more pronounced. As, you, as your drawing comes more and more to life, as you like it to be until you're satisfied. And if you don't like certain areas, you can fade them out with your kneaded eraser. Change your mind. You don't make the mistake, I always say. You just change your mind. As you start to see things. I hope that you can see that all right, everybody. And um, in a course, I tell everyone, make sure when you're done to always sign your name. You want to be in history. And some, you don't want to go down in history. You just want to be in history if someone was to find your drawing and wonder who did that. So make sure you always sign your work, either on the back, on the painting or drawing. And um, I signed every one of my illustrations on the back for the book. Um, I can't see you guys, but I hope you can see me. Yes, yeah, we can see you great, Rebecca. Thank you. Oh, okay. so good. And and um, I'm wondering, we have a little time if anybody wanted to ask questions, but um, sure. what if, if you had um, colored pencils, you could go over the graphite and or you could use watercolor or gouache to go over the graphite. But um, as I was showing you, for these kinds of, I'll show you some examples. There's that eye that I really wanted to highlight, have the sparkle of light. And I try to put it in each of the creatures. My very favorite painting in the, in the, at the very end, I hope you'll see like this painting too when you come to it in the book. Um, of the alewife, the boy says to his father, you know, do they, they, how do they celebrate? And just then, Pesca, with her tail, splashed into the water. And while the others weren't mentioned, but I put them, so you'd still continue imagining that school following Pesca, but I, I loved being able to use the watercolor and you can just barely see the scales coming and going, as I said, sometimes to express the form, just showing a few details is just as good as drawing every single scale. What you're trying to strive for is that feeling and however you can get to that place. 
in, with uh, interpreting Susan's words. You guys, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Sorry, it's yeah. that one. It looks oh, like okay. one person's trying to show you her picture. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So <laughs> wrong with it. I can't believe it. What is your name? Kaylin. Kaylin. Oh, Kaylin, that is absolutely beautiful. I love what you did. What's Thanks. your favorite part? What is your favorite part? You know, I may eat a baby fish. The, 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 and in the drawing is the baby fish. Yeah. I totally love it. it the, you know what I love is the way you did the outside contour. You enhanced that contour. And I, lo I really love the detail in the mouth. Have you seen have you seen Elwives yet? I did. Oh, fantastic. Near where you live? Yeah, um uh, I think, yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Well, keep doing that, honey. Keep drawing, fill your pages up. And sometimes when you see the Elwives together. You may see sometimes that they're dark on the top and light on the bottom, or they may shimmer a little bit, and you could use your school pencil and just dot, use it like a dot and bop, 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 bop. But I am so in love with your drawing. It's beautiful. Thanks. Thank you for so sharing it with us. No problem. <laughs> love it so much. And thank you for being in the group today. Do you have any questions at all? Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Rebecca? Um, what's an artist's day like? What's your day like as an artist? Do you work uh, certain times of day or? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. I, um, I like to sometimes it used to be working in the afternoons to late in the night. And then I would wake up so groggy, but some my favorite times are if I get up before the sunrise and I start to draw. That is magical. The just the place I have my cup of coffee and um, I'll just it's quiet. And then, you know, that moment before the sun comes, it's the beginnings. So it's a beginning of a new drawing, a new painting. And I usually try to get six hours, five to six hours a day. It could be later in the day or in the morning. It always changes uh, because I might do my research I might read in the mornings in that quiet time, and um, and and then I start sketching. It's almost like playtime, and then I can sit in the rest of the mode. I put on music. I have everything from jazz, country, um, bluegrass, just about every kind of music. Um, but it's always subtle in the background. When I'm working and when I teach, I love to be able to have music in the, the room with the children. It's nice. That sounds great. Yeah. Oh, and, and it's it's that morning time that seems the clearest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I have one more question for you, Rebecca, from the chat. Um, how long did it take you to illustrate Swimming Home? And do you have a favorite picture from the book? Oh, I love those questions. And I'll tell you, it, oh, it almost took me two weeks for every painting. And you need about 16 um, paintings for a 32 page book. So it took me about six months to work on it. Some artists, illustrators, they can do one in a month. 
but this process that uh, the way I work with the tracing paper, several drawings over and over, reading and then listening to my own voice with Susan's words. So it took about six months. And so the publisher likes to have its deadlines that you know when you start and um, you try and they realize the time frame it takes you. And then once they get the paintings, it takes another three to five months to actually print the books and then come from at this point South Korea to the United States several you know by boat and then to the warehouses and from the warehouses to buildings that house and wonderful schools finally and libraries it's just a process so perhaps a year altogether my work takes about six months and then another several months for the actual publishing part and then do you have a favorite picture from the book yes and i sure do as i was saying i'll show you well, we're we'll in your video now. If you could share that again, let me try and invite you. Oh, here we go. Okay. I'm so happy that um, this page, the very last page, when Pesca is celebrating in the flip of her tail and the splash. And this is the original painting. And um, you can see it's, it's just a little bit, a little bit smaller, but you see where I left space for the words and the gutter. Now some books love the gutter and to, they're doing more and more things with using the gutter like characters coming out of the gutter and are disappearing into the gutter but um when i was learning that was the first thing you don't want to lose have a, your head or your eye right here unless you want it to be there you want to be able to get to know the characters by having space for left or right and details and then it's okay to have the belly right there. And then of course, a place for the words. You guys can remember that, but that is my favorite. I, and sometimes when you're doing a book, you've drawn so much, you've painted so much through the whole process, you get really, really much better. And this one to me has bursts of color that I like and movement that I like. And I really love that splash of the tail. If that answers the question. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions from anybody? Let's see. I really love that drawing she did, that's awesome. <laughs> Let me show you my little doodle if you're interested. It's, it's not much there, but. I just use in a pen, obviously. Looks more like a goldfish. <laughs> no, fantastic. I love it. And you can add a little wash of color. I'm so happy you participated too. Thank sure. you, Brian. Yeah, of course. I love to draw too. So remember your style, everyone's style. I love it. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining, Rebecca, and we'll keep in touch. Um, yes, you let me know, and just if you need to cut, cut, and edit, edit, but I'm so glad to, to meet you all, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. This was so wonderful. I really loved having you. Thank you. Thank you. I send you virtual hugs, all of y'all. Hope I see you in person someday. Okay. Well, thank you from Vassalboro as well, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Take good care. All right. Good you night. too. Thank good night, you. Everybody. Thank good you. Night.